What I want to talk about tonight is destruction. It's a word we hear being used everywhere. Destructive technologies, destructive people, people destructing and created destruction. But what do we mean by destruction? What are the economics of destruction? I'm a big Otis Redding fan. I think he was the most brilliant R&B singer that we have ever seen. And I'm, I've always been interested to see how his career progressed during the 1950s and the 1960s. So Otis Redding, he gigged around America, and then he signed a record deal with Stax Records, who paid him to write music, develop albums, and paid for his studio time. And that's very different to how music is being produced today. So what we see is people producing music in their bedrooms or garages. They upload this music onto the internet. They then develop a fan base on a digital platform. And then they go out gigging and produce more music and upload that music onto the internet and so forth. <coughs> so it's very different to what Otis Redding would have done. Now this change in the music industries, it started in the mid-1980s. And during that time, the big recording labels, they were like the banks for bands. They would pay them to go touring for recording in the studios <coughs> and so forth. But during this time, there was a lot of digitalization uh, innovation happening, and along came a company called Napster. Now, the big recording studios at the time, they completely ignored Napster. They didn't think they were anything important. But of course, Napster led to iTunes, and iTunes led to Spotify. And Spotify completely changed the way we produce, distribute, and consume music. We could even say that the new technologies that were disrupting the industry also disrupt the type of music that was being produced. So we went from the guitar-based music and the new technologies introduced us to electronic music that <coughs> led us to synthesization and sampling, which led to hip-hop. So technology was changing every aspect of the music industry. Now what happened in the music industry can help us explain how the economy grows. And the economist that first proposed this idea was Joseph Schumpeter, an Austrian economist. Now what Karl Marx said was, capitalism is unstable and this will lead to its destruction. But Schumpeter said, yes, capitalism <coughs> is unstable, but this is what will drive the economy forward. So if we think back to the music industry, the way capitalism has worked there is that the established record labels or record studios and the bands who think they have a competitive position or a dominant position in the industry, they get disrupted by new startups that bring along new ways of, uh, new ways of music, of playing music, of distributing music and the old companies get destroyed. And this is what Schumpeter believes drives the economy forward. It's that creative impulse that all of us have. We as human beings, we have this desire to do new things, to try new things, to make what we have in our minds a reality. We want to make a difference. And it's these creative impulses that allows us to make changes and drive the economy forward. 
we see this in football as well. Johan Croft, one of the best footballers ever to play the game, he went to Ajax and he said, players no longer have positions. They might have numbers on their backs, but they'll be able to play forward or in defence or in mid midfield. It doesn't matter, they'll play everywhere. And he developed this football style of total football. And Ajax went on to become a very successful team and very exciting team for a short period of time. And then Cruyff moved on to Barcelona where he took that knowledge with him. And Barcelona became the club that we all know of today. Now, at Barcelona, uh, Pep uh, picked up this new way of playing football and he took this knowledge with him to Bayern Munich. He tweaked it a little bit, but he took it to Bayern Munich. Bayern Munich then became successful. And then he took that knowledge with him to Man City, and Man City then as well, the rest. So we see how that knowledge can be tweaked a little bit and improved upon on each step. And this is important for the economy because if the economy grows, it means we have more resources, we have more money, we can plow into other things, and we can see ourselves and others develop. And what Schumpeter said was that this creative um, ability of human beings, our desires to make new things, it's like a renewable resource. There is no limit to it. We always want to change things. Now sometimes we do see this paradigm shift where we see this very big shift and change in the economy. So unlike those small steps and small changes between football clubs, we do see these um, big steps. And what we're seeing at the moment is we're at the start of a new industrial revolution where we're seeing the digitalization of new things, of connectivities, and we're starting to see the emergence of companies like Uber. <coughs> so what does that mean to the economy? Well, if we think back to previous industrial revolution, so if we take, for example, when oil was a resource and the combustion engine was the technology, and the combustion engine it was exported, that knowledge was exported around the world, and people developed a cab. All of a sudden, the horse and the carriage became redundant. There was no need for them. But also what happened? The blacksmith that also offered a very important service for horse owners became unemployed. So unfortunately, at that period of time, great deal of people lost their jobs. And this helps explain why politicians, when they see this wave of creative destruction coming, their first response is to try and stop it, because there will be winners and there will be losers. So let's think about Uber for a second. Uber is a company um, that's banned in several countries because politicians believe the interest of the taxi drivers far away <coughs> the interest of consumers that would save money by having cheaper taxi fares. <coughs> but trying to stop Uber is like a record company telling a band that has released the most amazing album ever you're not allowed to release another album for the next 10 years because you're too good. Think about it, that would be crazy. But that's what we're doing to Uber. We're telling them you're too good at this, so stop it. <coughs> if we think about um, 20 years ago, one of the most innovative and exciting companies was Nokia. Nokia was a Finnish company um, that produced mobile phones and everybody at that time had a Nokia. If you worked in the professional industries 20 years ago, you most likely had a Blackberry um, that was produced by a Canadian firm. And along came uh, Johnny Ive 
uh, with this idea in his head for an iPhone. And Steve Jobs had the brains and the finance to back his idea. And they developed the iPhone and that destroyed Nokia and Blackberry. <coughs> Rarely anybody has a Nokia these days. And I haven't seen a Blackberry in 15 years. So this creativity, these technologies, new technologies that we see in the economy, we can't stop them. But what Schumpeter said was, allow the economy to work as it wants. Allow capitalists to work as they want. They will generate these new ideas and drive the economy forward. But have a state that is strong enough <coughs> to tax the winners and compensate the losers. Not only just to give them comfort, but also to encourage them to innovate and also come up with new technologies and drive the economy forward. Now we're seeing these disruption happening in, in all industries, whether that's in the music industry, the car industry or the phone industry. <coughs> But where I get excited is the disruption that we're seeing <coughs> with money. So the new technology has been applied to money. So currently, money is issued by central banks, which are quasi-private institutions. The money then is distributed among the economy and distributed to people and companies by banks that are private institution and the whole money supply is controlled by the state. Now Nathan Rothschild had an interesting quote and what he says here is give me the man that controls money. I don't care who controls the wars or who thinks they're leading the country, give me the man who controls the money and if I control this man, I control the country. In effect, what he's saying is money is power. <coughs> Where we're seeing uh, the new technology uh, being applied with money is in the digitalization of currencies or cryptocurrencies, as they're more commonly referred to. So, you trade with me, I trade with you, we develop a new payment system, something along the lines like Bitcoin. Now, I don't think Bitcoin <coughs> is the finished article, but I do think it's taken us somewhere very interesting. And what I find fascinating about Bitcoin is the way it's viewed in different ways, even within the same country. So, in the US, on the East Coast, Bitcoin's viewed as this anti-government, anti-Fed, anti-central bank, libertarian type of issue. Where on the West Coast, Bitcoin's viewed as this new technology that allows innovation and new ways of doing business and new innovation. And this is quite powerful stuff. Because let's imagine a future where Bitcoin overcomes all of its issues and the problems and there's more people in the economy starting to use Bitcoin and it starts to compete against other <coughs> currencies while being backed <coughs> by new technology. The Romans had a great saying, money doesn't smell. That is. I don't care where the money comes from, money is money. Why did the Roman empires, the emperors put their faces on coins? Because money is power, money is dominion, money is I'm the man, we got the Benjamins in America, and technology is going to disrupt all of that. Technology is going to disrupt central banking, it's going to disrupt banks, it's going to disrupt commerce, but more interestingly, but also slightly worrying and exciting, 
is going to move the power of money away from the state and give it to the people. And this is going to be fascinating stuff. Thank <laughs> you.